Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel session as a part of Open Source Summit Japan, Bridging Modern DevOps and the Mainframe, uh, coming here from the Open Mainframe Project. We have a great set of panelists here today. I'll introduce myself. I'll be the moderator and also a little bit of a panelist, I suppose, as well. My name is John Mertick. I'm director of the Open Mainframe Project, and I also serve as director of program management here at the Linux Foundation. Uh, I'll next introduce uh, Len Santolucia, chairperson of the Open Mainframe Project and chief technology officer and business development manager of Viacom Infinity. Welcome, Len. Hi, John. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be on the panel today. Thank you, Len. And we also have with us Jen Francis, for a developer advocate in the IBM Open Group and a master certified architect. Welcome, Jen. Hi, John. It's great to be here. It's great to see everybody today. Great. Well, let's just jump right into it. And uh, our first question really centers around the Open Mainframe Project and the, the Zoe Initiative as a part of it. And the Open Mainframe Project turned five years old this year. Zoe turned two. And we want to take a really look at the challenges and opportunities that led to the creation of the Linux Foundation's Open Mainframe Project and Zoe Initiative. And Len, I want to start with you since you uh, were there at the very beginning and maybe talk about what that looked like. Yes, I remember it well. And uh, it was a very exciting event, to be honest with everybody. You know, five years ago, when the inception of the Open Mainframe project occurred, that was also when IBM uh, made the announcement for the IBM Linux One system, which was um, the Linux only mainframe. It has all the characteristics and qualities of service that uh, the IBM Z mainframe has, but it's all dedicated to just Linux and open source. So it really was an exciting event. And um, since that time, boy, there has been a lot of things that have occurred with this organization in and around uh, IBM's Linux One and open source on the mainframe and open source on, on the Linux One system. So very, very exciting uh, things that have occurred. And then of course, you know, we're Zoe and many other Let's think, John, we're now up to about, what, 15 or so projects? Yeah, now? 16 projects, um, at probably the time you hear this recording. Um, some great progress, certainly. Yeah, very good. Jen, what do you think? Oh, wow. So the Open Mainframe Project, I think the first time I ever became aware of it was actually through you, Lynn, um, years ago. And we had a, an intern um, that was working on a blockchain project. And I remember watching them present out at SHARE, which is a user group conference uh, for the mainframe platform. And at the time, that was really what I knew about Open Mainframe Project through the Linux Foundation. And it wasn't long after that, that along came Zoe, which really became the first kind of um, collaborative uh, let's say technology that we could all use that it was not just a, a single company or organization creating it it was actually a group collaboration and it was actually great because the mainframe the platform itself has always had a huge sense of community um everybody wants to get together understand what the others are doing where they're struggling what they've learned things like that and the linux foundation through the open mainframe project has actually enabled that to happen through developing um, technology through developing educational resources they're actually sharing all these things that had kind of been you had to know where to find the right groups and the different geos and different things like that and now it's actually this uh, formal community um, and, and brought everybody together and zoe's just been the first big real project that everybody's joined in on mm. And it's been interesting. It's the mainframe communities almost came full circle because if we look at back at where open source, the roots of it, it's from the mainframe community in the 50s at Share and that early collaboration. And now we've came back full circle of bringing this community, which is exactly like you said, Jen, is always been a collaborative, always been there for one another, always had a, that great strength and now has came together right under the same banner here under the open mainframe project. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, let's skip ahead. Next question on the panel here. And we're going to dig a little bit into Zoe. And Jen, you remarked here, Zoe is that real, not only that first open source project on the ZOS platform, but really this first time where it really clicked as this, I was reading what you're saying is 
an aha moment. Like, oh, well, this isn't just a community, a, you know, vendor giving this project. It's three vendors coming together, collaborating on a huge technology. And that integration platform for really where ZOS is going and bringing in so many new stakeholders, but that at the same time, also enabling the platform for decades to come. Um, what did you kind of talk about and talk about just, you know, as this came into your purview, like what was the reactions? What have you been hearing? Tell me a little bit more. So it's always been really fun to watch over the last two years. So when they had the big announcement, I remember being like out at share and out at other conferences and the huge buzz around it. Everybody's like, what is this? What is this? And my first takeaway, and I think everybody's first takeaway was, oh, this would be great for development. Everybody was talking about, you know, the CLI or the fact that you could have a plug into VS Code. And that's great. And you can do cool things on it. And it allows us, you know, some opportunity to work uh, with the mainframe with ZOS that maybe we couldn't have before. But what I think has been missed is what's really picking up traction now in year two going into year three is the ability for the administration and management. It's having the API interface that you can work with. It's that you can actually do some really cool things with the CLI that give that and that management and administration. It's not just, oh yeah, I could deploy code to it or yeah, I can use VS Code to see some things. Um, you know, that's what kind of the initial reaction was. And I was like, no, wait, this is actually a lot more powerful than that. Let me see what else I can build. And we've seen some really cool advancements on top of that. Um, IBM has been working across all of its different development teams, Kix, DB2, IMS, um, to use the Zo uh, Zoe, you know, either CLI or the APIs to actually build out and, and allow for more interaction with their uh, different subsystems and things like that. So we're constantly seeing more and more advancement um, because of what the base open source project has done. Now all these different teams can also say, hey, I can actually make that work more for me and so we're seeing that and it being you know, opened up as well to the community for more uh, usage and, and open issues and kind of driving where it goes. Definitely, and, and thinking about that administrative um, part of, of the things that Zoe could potentially manage, you know, the one thing that always comes to mind, Len, and you know where I'm gonna be going with this, is the great uh, demo that Alex Kim, or actually not demo, it's a fully working um, you know, tool that Alex Kim has put out, um, you know, from Viacom Infinity and, and uh, the Viva, which I absolutely love, mostly because back when we were in conferences in person, he was carrying it around in a suitcase. And if you want to do a demo, he would just open the suitcase and just start doing it on the top. But tell me a little bit about that and tell me just, you know, what the experience has been like and what's that meant for Viacom Infinity? Well, thank you, John, for mentioning this. Uh, Viva, Vicom Infinity Voice Assistant. Um, I'm sure everybody knows Alexa and Google Home and so on, the, the consumer types of voice assistants. But um, we started getting this idea, uh, starting with Alex, Kim, and our team, that wouldn't it be kind of cool to be able to have voice control of the IBM mainframe? And uh, the thing that concerned us with um, using Alexa or Google was home was because of their security exposures. They're really designed for consumer level types of, of you know, voice and enterprise customers, um, ZOS customers, Linux on Z customers, you know, uh, ZVM, TPF, BSC, all those kinds of customers would be very apprehensive using a consumer level type of voice assistant. But when, when Zoe came along, uh, we got the idea that, hey, we could actually take advantage of the security of the mainframe because it interfaces with um, APIs very nicely uh, into ZOS and other, um, the, uh, the other operating systems available on the Z very transparently. And before we knew it, we had the Viva assistant talking to the mainframe. And when you talk to the mainframe, you wait, what you say is, you know how you say, hey, Alexa, or hey, Google? Well, you say, hey, TJ. Now, TJ has a lot to do with the building that's right behind my head here. And I was just going to ask you how it all tied in together, so I'm glad you <laughs> called that out. <laughs> yeah, it's the original lab in Endicott, New York, where IBM incorporated in 1924. And uh, I have uh, 
a lot of my family, starting with my grandfather and my father, and then me and a lot of other relatives and aunts and uncles that all worked there because that's where our family settled when they first came to the United States uh, from Italy. And I was destined to be part of the IBM family, I guess. Uh, I didn't realize it, but uh, it turned out very well. And my office is in that building right over my shoulder um, and the first floor of that building. And it was right next to the original office for Thomas J. Watson Sr., the founder of IBM. That's where the name TJ came from. So we thought it'd be out of nice respect and remembrance of, of him. And it's worked out very well. So uh, this voice assistant is no longer a prototype. It's actually a, a product. It's actually registered in the IBM Global um, Applications Registry, where people can look at it online anytime and um, see what it's all about and what, what the solution has to offer. So isn't that funny, using uh, those kinds of interfaces? Uh, uh, and thanks to the nice work that the Open Mainframe project did in uh, bring, bringing some semblance around the project of Zoe uh, and making it uh, really what it is today. That is absolutely fabulous. It's a really cool story. I mean, Jen, have you seen sort of other stories like that out in the cu the customers and folks that you're working with of just something interesting, something cool that has, you know, brought in, brought up um, because of Zoe? Um, not quite as cool as that. It's hard to top that. <laughs> that is true. That is true. So, you know, it's not a compa it's not a, it's not a contest, but I'm sure there's other interesting things. Yeah. So, um, it's actually, I guess, enabled a lot of um, new opportunities. So one of the things that we IBM do every year is the Master the Mainframe uh, competition, where we are encouraging students to go out and try to use the platform. And actually this year, we're leveraging Zoe through VS Code um, for the whole competition, um, which enables just a new way to work with the, with, uh, the ZWS platform we all know and love, but something that wouldn't have been possible two years ago. Um, mm -hmm. But now we can, and it's just brought a whole new life and really kind of reinvigorated um, the competition. I love it for some other reasons. We won't go into those today, <laughs> but it, <laughs> it, it, it does bring a kind of a modern look and, and feel um, and just allows people to focus on learning the technology um, and not doing a bunch of setup because the setup's quite simple. Yes. Yes. That's one piece of feedback I've heard quite a bit is just it's it's all ready to go. It's much simpler through VS Code. It's already a tool that students have at their disposal. So they're not trying to set up a 3270 emulator and all sorts of other pieces. Yeah. And that's actually um, one of the things I really love. So I tend to work with a lot of cloud-based technologists. Um, they don't want to think about where a server is. They don't want to have to care. They typically have a few different you know, IDE set up. VS Code being open source is one of the ones people commonly will have. And so when I can say, hey, just add this tool, let me give you the IP address, they're pretty happy to, and, and, and they're good to go. And they're then willing to learn to work with the platform. Um, whereas before I may have been like, oh, can you find a you know, 3270 emulator? Or, well, we really need some other tools or, or things like that. And it started to be like, you know, people start kind of put their shoulders up and like, I, I don't know, that's a lot of extra work. Yeah. Um, so it's really kind of opened it up to different mindsets. I'm able to show that you can do a lot of the same things on from that you would do with cloud, you can do on Z and things like um, Zoe enable that because it, it just looks exactly the same and you can switch perspectives with things like that and, and make it happen. It's fantastic. It's, it's, it's amazing as this community has come together, how this has evolved over time and just the new opportunities that open up and, and just things like that. I wasn't too long ago, I learned that the Master Meeting Program was using that. And I just thought that was just amazing of just how much that's made a transformational step in moving that forward. Um, so it's been really fabulous. Um, moving ahead here. So we're one of the key pieces of the Zoe framework and project is new interfaces. Um, some of them not necessarily new, they've been in there a long time, but pulling it together into a singular API uh, mediation layer. And the concept, you know, and Jen, you've been out working, you know, as a developer advocate with people before, and I throw the term API first out there, and that's just second nature, I can only imagine. And now that's how it came to the mainframe. That's a huge, huge step. Tell me, tell me a little bit more about like how that API first mentality, now that it's getting to the mainframe, and I know you've seen this in the cloud world and other worlds, and so that's kind of, you know, farther up the curve, but you're seeing this at the front end of the curve. Tell me what that's like. 
Yeah. So whenever you are starting to talk about, you know, different components you want to put them together, that's generally the first question is, okay, well, what does the API look like? You know, can you give me an API endpoint? You know, do they have a swagger page? You know, how can I look at how this is going to work? So having that kind of API uh, mediation layer um, really just opens the doors to possibilities. So if we go back a little bit and we look at something like um, ZOS Connect, when that first came out, and when you might remember how many years ago, that starts to blur together. You're better at remembering <laughs> the differentiation plan. Um, you know, that was like this is like huge moment for the ZOS platform. Like, oh my gosh, we can, you know, API enable Kix and, and DB2 and IMS. And, and this was really awesome. But now it's always saying, well, hey, not only can you API enable that, but you can actually API enable, you know, your management and your administration, which we hadn't really done as well before. Things like ZOSMF, you know, kind of started to enable it. Zoe works with that even more. Um, but then we also continue to see further development to have that API first extended to the mainframe. So Kix has GraphQL that's now available to work with the Kix bundle. So if you like GraphQL, that's another API layer that makes it really simple to do Kix bundle deployments. So as we continue to expand this idea of API first, working with the open source community, um, it just opens up the doors so that we can use some of the common skill sets that we have across other platforms, across other technologies um, to allow more people to work with such a powerful platform. That's very cool. And you know, the API first sort of approach is certainly something that the customers that you work with, Len, I mean, a number of them I know work in many of our other Linux Foundation projects as well. And the concept of API first, as I know, is a part of them as well. But now bringing that to the mainframe, what have you seen the impact in the customers that you're working with? Well, first of all, they have been able to open up the mainframe uh, in a secure way because these c connections through the uh, RESTful APIs all adhere to the, the security uh, rules and regulations that the mainframe uh, follows. So that's one very good thing because um, especially, you know, being involved a lot with the financial firms like I, I am on, on Wall Street, uh, they really found that to be very helpful because then it, it's helping them to bridge their way into a hybrid multi-cloud environment, which everybody's trying to do. And most of them have found that they were trying to or at least they thought they could in the beginning, oh, here comes the cloud, we can get rid of all our infrastructure, let alone the mainframe. And well, right away they found out that wasn't the case. Uh, there were some very nice things that could go to the cloud and should be on the cloud, but there's things that just can't go to the cloud and need to mm -hmm. remain for compliance rules and regulations. And this API capability just made it so nice to blend everything very transparently together. And, you know, uh, it also opened up to other um, software houses that were not um, looking at the mainframe. One that we happened to meet was a place called Private Key. You remember that, uh, mm -hmm. John? Yeah. And yeah. Private Key is integrated through APIs with the uh, Viva. And, oh, wow. Um, I yeah. didn't realize that. Yeah, and it uh, it allows um, you know you know how you go to a bank online and you get a, a code back to verify it, that it's you, right? Mm -hmm. Well, this does this with Viva, and it does it so transparently, so quickly, you, you hardly notice any interruption, but it verifies um, you know th this intention for a transaction uh, uh, through the use of this tooling that came available with APIs when it made, was made available with uh, Zoe and um, ZOS Connect and a lot of other things. And in Jen's um, world with, with CICS, there, uh, now Private Key is looking at interfacing directly to CICS through these APIs. And wow. so, yeah, so it's uh, gonna make, uh, uh, really very nice for the for the mainframe and those in the mainframe world. I love it that we've done this recording three times and every time I learn something entirely new out of it. It is just so fabulous. So, so for the I. folks at home, if you see this repeated, everyone is unique. You really got to check them all out. So it's 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 very cool. And you know, it's it's great. You know, the one thing I've been, you know, not as not as long involved in the mainframe world as either of you, 
but I, I have the privilege of being able to speak with a number of customers, speak with a number of vendors, sort of understand where their challenges are, you know, from a different angle. And the one thing that I've always found interesting is, you know, it, it, in the early days, it seemed like when I was starting this project, it was very mainframe or not, like it was an either or proposition. And the one barrier that the project has been slowly trying to open up is the mainframe and. Because if I look at many of, you know, the things that I've done in my career and the organizations I've worked with, um, it's, it's always been clear that an organization that has a hybrid approach to solving their computing challenges ends up being one that is ahead. They're unique. They have all of a sudden a unique differentiator between their competitors because they've taken the time and really built up that custom way to engage their customers and maintain their infrastructure and, you know, and to approach how they work their business. And, you know, mainframe's always sort of been a little bit of that one thing on the side here and the API first coming together. And I think both of you just illustrated this perfectly. It's just opening up those last areas that have needed to be opened up. And it's really just changed a lot of the trajectory getting from that mainframe or mentality to the mainframe and mentality, which I think has been really interesting. Well, cool. Uh, last question for the group here, and this is always the fun one of looking into the future. And Len, maybe let's start with you on this one. Future of DevOps in the mainframe, what are you seeing out there? It is starting to really become part of the, the uh, mentality of the mainframe groups within organizations. Uh, that's what I see happening. Um, th th they are becoming more comfortable with it because of the kind of tooling, especially some of the things we just talked about becoming available to allow it to fit into their, into the world of DevOps so that um, they can take advantage of CI, CD, uh, continues, uh, in integration, continuous development that um, other platforms have had the lead on. And, you know, um, one, on one of our other uh, sessions that we had, John, you might remember, it really helps the mainframe become part of the overall family. And, you know, family is very important, especially when we start thinking about this time of year with holidays and everything else coming up. If you all become one big family, you all become more trusting of each other and know how to, wh whose uh, strengths and each other's, uh, I wouldn't say weaknesses, but differences. Um, and actually, instead of using the word strengths and differences, I like to say, use each other for what you're designed to do. You know, the mainframe designed to do different things than what other platforms are, uh, other alternative platforms are designed to do. And as soon the customers that are starting to get that and have gotten it for a while, have learned how to blend the environments and especially with that concept of the hybrid multi-cloud also, not just only on-prem infrastructure uh, integration. That's fantastic. And, and I love the concept of family. And when I think of family, you know, you always think of longevity because families are generations. They're not just one group, but it's a generational thing over time. And when we think about open source projects, you know, not just at the Open Mainframe Project, but just broadly at the Linux Foundation that where we get involved with, there are ones that look at sustainability as a key part of that. And sustainability means it's not just a few years thing. It's not just, you know, one generation. It's a long-term investment mainframes, you know, been around, you know, since, you know, geez, you know, almost 65 years now, uh, longer if you, you know, get some of the early machines in there. And when I see efforts like Zoe being trusted into a group like this and other ones that have came along, uh, a recent one, CBT tape, which uh, may be not familiar with most of the audience, but if you're looking um, at the early work in share and those early collaborations that came together in a canonical tape in 1975, probably one of the oldest open source projects before open source projects were there, more of those are turning towards this direction of we want to continue this, we want to pay this forward, we want to take this, not just for the next generation, but for generations to come. And I, I think that really that concept of family really is a, is a great way to kind of circle all that together. Uh, Jed, what are your, some of your thoughts as you look at the future of DevOps in the mainframe? 
It's kind of a mix of what you're just saying about family, but also a mix of John, what you said before about it, it's no longer a mainframe or it's mainframe and, or, and it really is that. So to me, the future of DevOps in regards to the mainframe is really the blending of coming together as that family across your entire organization. It's regardless of what kind of developer you might be, you're going to have the tools that you need to use. So whether you're a data developer, whether you're an application developer, you're a UI, UX, whatever, you're going to have the tools you need to get the job done. And they're going to be able to integrate um, with, the, with the repository, with source code management, that there will be processes in place to allow the automation and deployment to the backend uh, platforms that are available to it, whether it's a cloud platform, whether it's an in-house platform, doesn't matter that those things can all work together. And historically, kind of mainframe was always unique. Um, it had its own repository, it had its own tools. We very much control deployment and we still absolutely want to have the checks and balances in place. It's not just, you know, release, release something without having everything in place. But we now are, have the ability and really are trying to integrate to say, yeah, we could use those tools. We could still put those checks and balances in place, but we can actually fit the same DevOps pipeline. We can now have that CI, CD, that continuous integration, continuous delivery. You can use whatever um, framework for development that you want to do, but those tools, um, by the time your code is ready, we can actually use those same tools to get to our platform. So it actually does allow us to all come together as a family, bring our unique characteristics to actually make things the best that they can be. Exactly. And be able to all have dinner around the same table and enjoy one another and, you know, leverage all of that great heritage and things that, that while make us unique, also bring us also together. It's, it's such a, such a great analogy. And I, and I look at it very much the same way. Uh, I mean, turn back the table five years, how many times would you have seen DevOps and mainframe mentioned in the same sentence? And now this is, we're doing a panel about this. We're doing a panel because this is mentioned all over right now. I mean, I know Jen, you've, you've seen it, you've contributed to articles I know in this space as well. And uh, Len, you're seeing it with your customers, but it's just, it's fantastic to see this all just coming together. And it, you know, the, we're, I, I'm, I'm usually really bad at being a soothsayer on things. So I never like to do predictions of the future. But what I will say is I think we're seeing this beginning to grow and seeing organizations not only looking at that mainframe and looking at the investments that are happening there and figuring out how they fit more in the line of business, but maybe there's some potentially some customers out there that are thinking, geez, that, that's a hardware I can take advantage of. There's some really useful things that I can do otherwise that maybe I need to have this as a part of my IT infrastructure. Yeah, and if you watch the open mainframe um, group, if you join the Slack channels and things like that, you'll see people asking and looking for those opportunities. Like, I've been hearing about this. I'd really like to try it. I'd really like to learn more. That's awesome. It would have been hard a few years ago to find those people if they could find things like the listserv that was available they they really had hunted and they tried and and so you kind of we've now made that barrier a little easier it's easier to find where you can you know ask that community you don't feel like so much of an outsider you can see people active and talking and that really does change everything having that community having it being available and welcoming um and that will only continue to drive where the future of devops go because you get as you get more people interested you're going to need to drive more of that integration more of that family and that community working together and that certainly have happened here. I think since uh, Zoe came in two years ago, the year after we doubled the number of projects in 2019 and then 2020, we're on pace to double it again, which you know shows that that's the, the community's coming together and it's all, it's all in different realms. I and mean, we've seen a lot of work in COBOL in the last year without a lot of the needs of our society, but we've also seen you know, further investments even in the devs, DevOps and education spaces as well. So it's, it's, it's a great time to be involved in mainframe. And it's also just great to see for this community, for so many people that have put their lives and their careers into it that are wanting to carry this forward. And, and I've heard from so many of them that that's one of their big things is how do we carry this forward? And to be in this position where this project is able to do that is, is just fantastic. Well, I want to, oh, sorry, I didn't, you had something there, Jen? Go ahead. Okay. I was just going to bring us to a close. I want to thank these two great panelists. Uh, this has been great insight from both of you uh, being both deep in the mainframe world. Talked a lot about the open mainframe project today. If this is interesting to you, I would really encourage you to head to our website, openmainframeproject.org. You can learn 
more about the project, you can subscribe to our newsletter. If you go to our projects page, which is slash projects, you can learn about any of our 15 and actually that's one off 16 now hosted projects and working groups get involved. They're all open communities. They're all eager for people to get involved. They have a mailing list. They have open meetings. They're on Slack. So there's plenty of ways, all the codes on GitHub, plenty of ways to get involved in there. And if you're an organization, you're watching this and you're watching this because your company has investments in the mainframe and it's important to you and it's important to where this is going just as much as it is for this panel, you can become an organizational member and that helps drive forward that stewardship and showcases your organization as key to wanting to drive that future. And you can learn about that on our join page as well, or email us at membership.openmainframeproject.org. So with that, I want to thank you both. This has been a great panel. I've always enjoyed talking with both of you. I hope everyone in the audience has enjoyed this as well. And I hope you also enjoy the rest of Open Source Summit Japan, but thank you both. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. And uh, John, it was nice working with you again here today. Good to see you, Lynn. Same here. Terrific. Thank you all. <laughs>